quickly. Uh, I hope I can share it now because before not. Yeah, uh, I, I gave it back. Right. So let's introduce. Uh, uh, can you see the screen? Can yes, you see my screen? See you. Okay, then let's make it easy. There's a university at the tip of Africa that's right at the top of its game. It's a place with a proud history and legacy pulled upwards by a future that will not be tamed. It brims over with powerful ideas that again and again lead to potent action and real change. Since when? Six decades long, it's been home to groundbreakers, change makers, planet shakers, and it's still going strong. It's the home of forward-thinking, higher learning, homegrown pride and a story still unfurling. Independent thought which sparks innovation, mindful global citizens and their perpetual liberation. Today, this is my home, my community, my springboard, my zone. Like iron sharpening iron, here my potential is mined, my mind is refined, and my future redefined. It's our time to learn from our past and our histories, to be the leaders of tomorrow's victories. It's our time to stand up and step into our light. To rise with Africa and all the world by our side. As you may have uh, uh, guessed, this is the 60th uh, anniversary of uh, the University of the Western Cape. Um, uh, please, uh, Professor Franz, uh, all yours. You can share the screen. Let's Good start. afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Women in Science session. The University of the Western Cape is one of South Africa's leading academic institutions when it comes to science. And this is largely due to the most impressive women that are involved. Today, we have three dynamic leaders that will be speaking to us, Professor Jose France, Professor Priscilla Baker, and Ms. Nkanzezi Sikakani. Just a little bit about Professor France. Professor France is an academic leader and currently the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research and Innovation at the University of the Western Cape, where she is responsible for the strategic vision of research and innovation. Prior to this position, she was the Dean of the Faculty for Community and Health Science at UWC, her strategic interests include the promotion and advancement of research for impact through knowledge exchange and capacity building in health professions, education and faculty development. She has secured research funding both nationally and internationally to continue research and do capacity development in the field of health professions, education and development of emerging researchers. Her commitment to human, human development is reflected in the numbers of masters, 45, and PhD students 15 that she has supervised and her academic activities in terms of teaching, learning and research is evident in her more than 100 publications. Professor Franz, we're most delighted that you can address us today. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Melody, and thank you to Nico for inviting me to be here this afternoon. I know that I'm not a physicist, so I'm not going to be talking any physics, but I, if you heard the introduction, it's about um, capacity building and what are we doing as scientists to do capacity building? So my talk this afternoon is to encourage women in science and also to, to just to encourage and motivate that we need to be conscious of the fact that there's still a big need out there for us to capacitate women in the field of science. I'm going to do a short presentation. My talk will not be long. Um, can you see my presentation? Yes, Professor, you can just put it in presentation mode. There we go. So I just yes. want to remind us this afternoon about um, women in science and what women, how women have actually paved the way and how we as women need to take up our space in terms of being scientists out there. 
So the history of women have demonstrated that they, it's for a long time since the 1800s that there have been various women who have um, taken up their space in science. Women have successfully pioneered their path into a career which is largely male dominated, leaving behind a legacy for future generations. And so this afternoon, I want to say to all the young women scientists out there that we have got a path that we have come and that we still need to move forward in terms of driving this tra trajectory of women in the STEM fields. One famous woman that we all know, woman that we all know about is Marie Curie. And she really went out there to drive the agenda of, of um, women scientists. She was a Nobel winner, not once, but twice. She didn't stop in, in, to, to do what she needed to do, despite challenges that she faced. And these challenges were, were, various, um, were there in various ways. And today, we still face some of these challenges. We still face um, sexism. We still face the fact that um, the, the scientific world is seen only for men. We need to open the discussion. And I'm, I, I'm so thankful, Nico, that we have this opportunity here this afternoon just to share that women also play a role in the scientific field. If we look at Nobel Prize winners over the years, since 1901, the, the um, Nobel Prize has been introduced, including the Peace Prize. And only for, the Nobel Prize has only been awarded to 53 women since 1901 to 2018. And within that, Marie Curie won it twice. Only three women have been awarded the Nobel Prize in physics. In 1903, it was Marie Curie. In 1963, it was Maria Gupert Meyer. And 2018 was Donna Strickland for a contribution to lasers. So if my basic maths is correct, 877 men have won the Nobel Prize. This, I must say, is quite a startling gap. And so therefore, having the discussion about women in science in 2020 is still an important topic to be engaging in as we're wanting to move towards equity. And so women and science, the questions that I want to ask, is it still necessary to have this conversation? And I think I've just answered that question in saying, yes, it is still necessary for us to have the conversation about women and science. Is science and scientific discovery still only the bastion of men? And do we as women need a special and concerted kind of encouragement to step forward and to take a place at the Petri dish? I'm posing this question to challenge you this afternoon. Where is it that we find ourselves and how do we encourage women to continue to stay relevant? Science and gender and the equity conversation is high on the agenda for SDGs. We need to inspire women and girls to engage in science. However, we find that there are certain challenges that excludes women from participating in science. And we need to acknowledge that. And we need to be able to, to, to embrace it and to find ways to make the gap in science less for women. And so look at what are the factors that deter women from taking up careers in, in the STEM fields. What are some of these challenges? And so I, I just allude to some, some of this is that if you look at the research groups that we find um, women participating in, men are the scientists, they are the leadership positions and women play the more supporting roles. That should not be the case. We should allow women to step up and take up the roles that they are meant to take up. Sometimes women are not being considered to participate in the research projects because their capabilities are underestimated. And it's even thought that women have less aptitude for science than men. These are some of the assumptions and misconceptions that are out there that we still need to challenge and that we need to change as we move forward. Other barriers is that female academics in STEM have reported um, gender discrimination. And these you'll find in literature. It talks about that there's a, a challenge with salary, promotions, access to space, equipment, staff, experience, etc. And so despite the fact 
that there is recognition being given to women and for us to attract diversity in the sciences, there are still obstacles that women face in their careers that we need to acknowledge and that we need to make more um, embracing so that women do not find themselves isolated in the field where, that is primarily dominated by males. How do we change our old ways? How do we make a difference? How do we all, males and females, contribute to changing this? Transformation is key, but it's not just a word that we should use and bander about. We should really have clear directive, direction and interventions at how we can recruit, recruit more women into the STEM fields and how we can accommodate them to allow them to thrive. Because if we make the environment more accommodating, women will thrive as much as men. I just looked at, I want to share this article that was shared on our website in terms of the University of the Western Cape and having top 1% of cited scientists worldwide um, from our university. It was a very interesting article and I'm proudly UWC that this article surfaced. But I want to show you something from this article. When they looked at the criteria for evaluating citations, you see the list of names of those who came up as top scientists at UWC. What do you see there? The question if I had asked the students in front of a class would have been, they are all dominated male names that come out. But when we look at different criteria other than only citations, then you will see that productive researchers that emerge, they are women in the field. And so I've ticked them with red. Suddenly, the, the playing fields become more even if we look at different um, criteria for measuring who are the scientists out there and who are the scientists that are making research count in our communities, not only in the labs. And so I looked at this document and looked at the percentage of women um, researchers across the world. And if we, I'm not going to go through each one of these, but just to look at the, the number of women researchers in the world in 2014 was at 28.8%. In 2016, it was at 29.3%, a mere 0.5% increase. If we are to reach the 2030 goal of equity in terms of what we're wanting to do. We need more action to grow women in researchers. Because if you must extrapolate this figure from 2016 to 2020 at an increase of 0.5%, we would probably only be touching 31.5% or 32% of women researchers across the world. But if you look at the amount of women who are supposed to be uh, um, people in the world, then the number is not equal. We really need to start unpacking why it is that women are not participating in the field of science. Gender parity is a real issue still in 2020. It is a discussion that we need to have and engage in as we look at our research teams, as we look at the environment in which research is con conducted and how we can promote women to participate in the field of science. Two articles that emerged in 2020 still talks to the gender inequality in terms of women. The one was, where are women gender inequalities in COVID-19? And this was published in BMJ. And another in Nature Communications spoke about the association between early career informal mentorship in academic collaborations and junior author performance. And in both these articles, the issues around women and their place in science and where, who should be mentoring them were still being challenged. 2020, we have not reached the point where gender parity is no longer needed to be a discussion. So the question I ask you this afternoon is, how do we begin to change this phenomenon? We need to begin by bluntly and openly addressing social, societal stereotypes that consists and continue to persist even in 2020. Secondly, education must truly become the great equalizer it is said to be, because we cannot have a world in which women account for almost two thirds of all the adults, and yet 
women are not featuring in the, in the field of science. Moreover, we need to address the impact that negative gender norms in society continue to have within the education system. Is it maybe our teachers who influence the attitude of subject choices? We need to look at these kind of um, challenges that is, that is faced out there. Second, we finally, or second last, I think, we need to create an enabling environment and increase the number of girls studying maths and science out there. We need to address the leaky pipeline at tertiary institutions. Globally, women outnumber men at bachelor's and master's level, but their numbers are dramatically reduced at PhD level. And we need to ask ourselves the questions, why? Why is that happening? What are the reasons? What is the environment like that does not promote women to move on from master's to PhD level? So this afternoon, I want to end by saying COVID-19, Nico and your team, has provided us the opportunity to do a taste of nuclear physics online. And this opportunity has broadened the scope for more people to tap into a conference such as this, both nationally and internationally. And I want to encourage you and your team, as you look at um, the taste of nuclear physics, as you look at it, how do we go forward marketing? How do we go forward marketing not only physics, but science to more women? Can we use this platform that we have created through this online conference to really engage more women in the field of science? I want to say and end that every scientist dream of doing something can help the world. And so as we turn to scientists to, to deal with the um, COVID-19 um, virus, I also want to turn to scientists this afternoon to say to you, we can make a difference in the field of science in terms of women and science. I thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Professor so Franz, for that insightful presentation and for taking time to be with us today. We appreciate it. Thank Our you. next speaker is Professor Priscilla Baker, who is a distinguished woman scientist. Professor Baker is a recipient of the prestigious Women in Science Award. She is also the Sarchi Chair in Analytical Systems and Processes for Priority and Emerging Contaminants, co-head of UWC Sensor Lab and specializes in the application of frequency modulated electrochemical techniques that can be applied in water analysis and treatment, bio and industrial cat catalysis, as well as energy related applications. She is also the director for the South African Systems Analysis Center from November 2017 until present and is currently senior professor at UWC. Her research emphasis on analytical chemistry, electrochemistry, nanomaterials, as well as sensors for priority and emerging pollutants. She's published 65 research articles in international and national journals, written eight book chapters, collaborated with researchers in US, Germany, and France, participated in international teaching and training programs at universities in France, Portugal, and the UK, and is an active member of two research consortia funded by the seventh framework program of the European Union. I'll give you Professor Priscilla Baker. Thank you very much, Melody, for that very elaborate introduction. And thank you very much, Professor Nico Osa, for this opportunity. It's indeed a rare honor to be included in a nuclear physics panel. But now that you all know that I'm a scientist and you've heard some of the academic background, what do I have to say on the issue of women in science following that eloquent presentation of our DVC, uh, who obviously looks at the bigger picture of presenting the case for women in science. I'm actually going to start off by quoting the um, classical image of women that was shattered in 2019, when Zozibini Tunzi took the stage and was capped the winner of the Miss Universe competition. And her winning statement was, we should be teaching young girls to take up space. But if, if we take that statement to a chemistry level, then we understand that matter can only occupy space at one time. At one one time, the, the object can only occupy space at one 
point in time. So you can't have two objects in the same space at the same time. That's what I'm getting at. And so for me, when it comes to women in science, we have to see them alongside the position of men in science. For me, the two are indistinguishable. And so rather than share any analytical chemistry with you today, or rather than share any of the accolades that have so eloquently been mentioned, because I think those are relevant at some point, but for today, I want to take the opportunity, if you will allow me, to share some quotes from prominent scientists that you will already know and respect. Um, and then perhaps I'll put a case to you for consideration. So some motivational quotes from scientists, and I'm gonna start with, everything is theoretically impossible until it is done. And no, this is not a scientific quote, but apparently Google tells me it's a quote often quoted by PhD students. And so point number one, it's usually that point in your lifetime or in your scientific journey when you realize that your supervisor has something to teach you, be they male or female. Then we see the second quote, the reward of the young scientist is the emotional thrill of being the first person in the history of the world to see something or to understand something. Nothing can compare with that experience. And that's a quote by Cecilia Payne Gaposchkin who is a British-born American astronomer and astrophysicist, so perhaps you know her better than I do. It says that in 1925, she did a doctoral thesis on, composed of, on what that stars were comp uh, primarily composed of hydrogen, um, et cetera. And so what does this mean for me? When, so, so remember, I'm trying here very hard to, to bring some value to your, your deliberations. And, I believe that I'm speaking to many young people around the world in the domain of nuclear physics, but also budding scientists. And to you, I want to say today that never forget that thrill of your first successful experiment. Never forget the thrill of when you first looked at the stars as a diamond studded black velvet curtain and realized that it was hot gas uh, and that there were things exploding and moving that you didn't understand. Never forget the awe of science, because there is so much that we know, but also so much that we don't know. And when we become jaded, we don't have the motivation to look for the next big throw. So let the next, the challenge of the next big throw be your motivation. My third quote is from someone whom we all know very well, both in physics and, science, and chemistry. It's from Isaac Newton, who said, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. And this again is a principle that I try to instill in all of my students. All of us come from a social context that has shaped the person that we are. And government systems, political systems, people, groups try to put us into boxes that make them feel comfortable. But my challenge to you today is don't let others define who you are or who you should be. Remember where you come from and honor that heritage, because I believe that each one of us have our own specific heritage and journey so that we can be a benefit to someone else who didn't have that. It doesn't make us less and it certainly doesn't make us better than any other person. But it is important for us to remember that context so that we can shape the changes. Isaac Newton, of course, I just put that at the bottom there, also a mathematician, physicist, and astronomer. So I'm going here for the link with astronomy, forgive me, and physics and, and the likes, because I'm not a physicist, right? My second last quote says, science is not only a disciple of reason, but also one of romance and passion. And this one struck me because I said that matter can only occupy space at one specific you know, time in space, if you like. So something has to move, for something else to come into. So if we say women have to occupy the space, are we saying that men have to move? And then I find this quote by someone like Stephen Hawking, whom we will remember had many challenges in his physical existence, but also made so many contributions to our knowledge and the advancement of science, right up until his time of passing when he was associated with the University of Cambridge. And when he says science is not only a disciple of reason, but also one of romance and passion, then you ask yourself, when someone has so much to overcome, 
has he never left has he never lost his his sense of romance or passion does it was that relevant for him at all and obviously the answer is yes because that is one of the quotes that he is remembered for so again to the young scientists out there don't lose that shiny impression of knowledge of dedication of scholarship of applying yourself because the ones who are not walking that path with you they don't see that romance they don't see the commitment and the dedication and as he quoted it's the science is not just the disciple of reason so it's not just the book knowledge and the number crunching but also the you and the humanness in you that helps to shape your thinking and that uh, encourages the discovery and the throw of science. And then, of course, I'm going to close with the, uh, the last quote for this little uh, presentation. Nothing in life. OK, now my screen. Sorry, I have to move my screen. <laughs> Nothing in life is to be feared. It is only to be understood. Now is the time to understand more so that we may fear less. And this is a quote from Marie Curie, whom the DVC has just expanded on in terms of her contribution to science. And someone so powerful, so knowledgeable, says to us, nothing in life is to be feared. It is only to be understood so that fear may make way for reason and understanding. And in this time that we're living in, we are bombarded with input. You know, the, the online life and learning makes everything faster. And I, I know from my experience with training young people that it brings a sense of being overwhelmed. It brings a sense of being disconnected at the same time as it brings that big thrill and that big reward and the quick answers which you like so much. But don't be afraid of the challenges in your real life, in your science, in your writing, in your growth as young scientists that you have to deal with. The fear of the unknown for personal, professional, or in your spiritual development. Embrace all of who you are and know that you are more than your circumstances. And so from all these famous people that you see on the screen, why on earth should you listen to me? In my short lifetime, I'm just a girl from the neighborhood. I've also been um, labeled and tried to be put into boxes. But I had the privilege of growing up with five brothers and a father, so an all-male environment. It never made me feel less of a woman or less of a capable individual than what I thought I needed to be. I then studied and worked in the domain of chemistry, natural sciences, a hardcore male environment. I can honestly say that I respect each and every colleague, male or female, that I've worked for. And my first boss was a female, um, you know, so I worked under female leadership right from the beginning, not in science, but my first boss is I had to work. And my journey may have so much overlap with many young people out there. And so when today we read a CV of accolades, I don't want you to get caught in the science. I will share my science with you on another platform. 10 minutes, certainly. Nikki, I think you will agree with me. It's just impossible to talk science in 10 minutes, especially if we're changing focus to another area. So I, I can't do that. But if you Google me and if you give Google some of my papers, of course, then you will learn a little bit about it. But if you look at the accolades, they mean absolutely nothing if we've lost the throw of science, because then our lives become humdrum. We just want to uh, hand in the next report by deadline because we have to. But when we apply our minds with that, that passion to seek for knowledge, understanding where we come from, that we are complete beings, that science is not all who we are, we begin to remember our value as women. We begin to represent ourselves as fully capable competitors. And it would not matter whether men try to put you in a box. It would not matter whether women try to put you in a box. Let's be honest, dear girls, and call it as it is. Let's be true to ourselves. Let's tap into what we know our gifts and our strengths are, whether we be male or female. And let us build a world that will grow new knowledge for the benefit of everyone so that we eradicate fear and we replace it with knowledge. We replace it with empowerment. We replace it with a stage where all players can be equal. Now, I'm not contesting the fact that there are major inequalities around the world, and it saddens us. 
But I'm saying to you today, as young scientists out there, be responsible in your advancement and give credit where credit is due. Do not be afraid of greatness. Some of us are born to greatness. Some of us achieve greatness. And some of us have greatness thrust upon us because of the time and space that we occupy. Embrace it with passion, with romance. Seek the thrill of science and shine like the stars that you are. Thank you, Nico. Thank you, Melody. Thank you to everyone at the 10th Taste of Nuclear Physics for including me in this little conversation. And I'd be happy to talk science with you at another time. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Professor Baker, for your insightful uh, message and also for those thought-provoking quotes. Our next speaker is Ms. Kanzezi Sikakani. She's one of our vibrant um, UWC students. Just a little bit about her. Um, Ms. Sikakani is a 21-year-old black female born in Johannesburg and based in the Western Cape. She's currently registered at the University of the Western Cape as a BCom undergraduate student and employed at Goodhart FM as an air presenter. She's a staunch believer of neoliberal feminist movement and empowerment and displays this belief through her involvement in social initiatives and projects. She has represented South Africa in 2017 on behalf of the GTS through its Sasta department and has represented the Gauteng province in multiple science finance and public speaking tournaments. She's also a UWC Society Executive at Snake Nation South Africa and has eagerly pursued the proliferation of creative hubs and platforms for the Western Cape youth through this venture. She will be graduating in the year 2022 with an undergraduate business degree majoring in economics and finance. While Kanyezi has specially written a poem for this occasion, so we're looking forward to hear, hearing you. Thank you so much for that introduction, Ms. Melody Williams. I'd like to give a special greeting to all of the distinguished scientists, to the speakers and the audience today. It is a special honor and privilege to be invited into spaces with people who are doing big things and who are informing our daily lives. The poem that I have decided to write today is one that gives an account of the difficulties of the student journey. Most of us have been students, especially undergrad students, and we know how this journey is typically characterized by love and infatuation. So this poem today will be detailing the account of a young man's journey of love expressed through science. I hope you enjoy it. I don't know much about science. So when you teach me about the equations of the universe, about the tight lines of code which compile the twisting helices, it seems to me like just numbers and stuff. But I think you can understand the science of how you are the amino acids in my cells, the building blocks of my life, how you are my atmosphere, the PV to my NRT. You are the increasing pressure. You decrease my volume. Accelerated particles rattling against my sternum. You are the current through my veins. And I want to be the magnetic field curling around you, like your fingers delicately winding through mine. You see, we are fundamental opposites. You are electricity, I am magnetism. We are science and song, inevitably and infinitely intertwined. You are my poetry. You are the current through my veins, the moving charges across my synapses, filling spaces between with atoms and oxytocin, building like a charging capacitator, resisting building to infinity, grinding my world to a halt. You are my flux and I want to be your current, fighting the things that change you and together our wires will sing the paradox, not paradox, of musical Tesla coils. You make me laugh and the force of you punches air out of my gut 
I am falling and falling and falling. And the force of you is pulling me down. The drag is pushing me up, increasing with every single moment that I hold you. Force times the time is your impulse, changing my momentum, positive to negative, velocity back and forth, spiraling into a vortex that rips the air out of my lungs and leaves me dizzy. Loving you is more than just theory. Thank you. Wow. In Kalyezi, that was absolutely beautiful. You really did that well, Pearl. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank to all of our speakers today, Professor Franz, Professor Baker, and Mr. Kakani, we thank you for being with us today in our Women in Science session, and we wish you well with your further endeavors. Thank you. Okay.